Maybe an, an, a helpful thing to do right now would actually be to go over a little bit of the um, anatomy. And I, I see that you brought a model that I think will make it easier um, for, for everyone to kind of understand. So um, I want to start by asking when you deal with your female patients who presumably are much more familiar with this anatomy than, than men are, what surprises you the most? When a woman comes into your clinic um, and you're taking care of her, what are you most surprised by in terms of her lack of knowledge about her own body? Anatomical lack of education um, from a- Just well, literacy? Liter from a, from a um, where was the sex education? Well, we, did, did we have it? Did we go, I mean, from a uh, verbiage perspective, referring to the vagina as the vaginal, that's the vaginal canal is the vagina, the vulva is the outside of the vagina. There's labia majora and minora. And um, all the way down to the to the clitoral nerve and sort of the fact that it has different different nerve roots. Um, and so if we think about, you know, looking at this model, uh, this is sort of if a female is lying down on her back, that's the angle that you're looking at. Um, there was a great study that was done recently that said that only 41% of Gen Z men could accurately identify the clitoris on a pictorial. Um, women, surprisingly- and Sorry, what, what, what would that be for Gen X? Like how much of that is a representation of declining intimacy as, as, as people are in younger generations? Or is that a general statement of men, period? Uh, I take from that- sex education needs to get better. I, I mean, I sort of take from that the, the need for better sex education that's actually anatomical and not fear-based. And so women as well, I mean, most women, not all, do know about the clitoral hood, or the, which is the clitoris or the, the bulb. Um, that's what we sort of think about in terms of the mm -hmm. tip of the iceberg. But what women often don't know is that they have sort of what we call is the vestibule of the clitoris, which are these sort of bulb-like structures that can receive engorgement or when there's an increase in blood flow. And then there's the crew of the clitoris, which is these nerve structures that go on either side of the labia minora. It's a wishbone-like structure. And what's really fascinating is to sort of normalize that anatomy can and should look different. Um, there's a great website called the Labia Library that normalizes all different types and sizes of labia minora and majora. Um, but the wishbone structures are often asymmetric as well. And so it is quite common for a woman to experience greater, greater pleasure on one side of the vagina versus the other, meaning that this nerve root of the clitoris may be thicker or more sensitive. There's over 8,000 nerve roots as a part of the clitoris. And there can be more focused on one side versus the next. And so I, I hope that half of your listeners are thinking, I always wondered why I was a righty or I always, oh, yeah, I'm a lefty. But I, I also hope the other 50% are wondering if you've been with your partner for a long enough time, I hope you know if your partner is a righty or a lefty um, hmm. because there's asymmetry in how we experience pleasure. Um, and then very interestingly is that there is, you know, if you're sort of looking at the uh, tip of the clitoris, there's a nerve root. There's a part that goes sort of inside the vagina. And that's what we talk about in terms of um, social terms. We talk about the G spot. And what that is, is it's a branch of the clitoris that runs along the anterior or the front part of the vagina. It's um, about a third into the vagina. The best way to find it is to, if you're sort of, if a woman is trying to find it on herself, is to take her dominant hand, middle finger, stick it as far in as you can and sort of do a, a come hither movement or sort of movement of the finger towards the top part of the vaginal wall. It's easier to find when you're aroused because there's engorgement of the, t the tissues. Um, it feels a little more rugated and you'll know that you're there if you feel a sensation to, to urinate, but if you relax into that, you, you won't. Um, um, and so only about 10% of women now are able to orgasm from stimulation of that internal branch of the clitoral nerve. There's some data that shows that with education that can go up. And so talking to women about how they can find the anterior branch of their clitoral nerve not only allows them different ways to orgasm, um, but also gives them a sense of empowerment and sort of ownership to sort of talk their partner through how to sort of maintain pleasure. Um, but for those people who can't have orgasms from the inner part of their vagina, the other 90% are having orgasms from external stimulation of the clitoral nerve. And so Dr. Lauren Stryker says, you know, for the 10% of women who can orgasm via the G-spot or the anterior branch, that's great. And she diagnoses the other 90% who can't 
orgasm from stimulation of the internal nerve as normal. Um, so it's totally normal if you can't have an orgasm from that part of the clitoral nerve. But many women, after hearing this podcast, I hope try, um, partners should try. It has a little bit, it has better blood supply than the tip of the iceberg. And so as we age, this is one of my favorite techniques um, for women in the perimenopause and menopausal period as their hormones change and the nerve fiber degrades a little bit. Teaching women how to have orgasms from the part of the nerve that is better innervate, better has a better blood supply can help maintain pleasure and help maintain interest in sexual activity as we age. All right. So when a woman is having intercourse, and maybe for the percentage of guys might, who might not be familiar, can you point out where the entry to the vagina is on this model? Yeah. So here's entry to the vagina. Um, of those, um, there is um, there are some statistics that talk about what women can what percentage of women can orgasm simply by having penetrative intercourse, so um, yep. penis here. And what's interesting is that the distance of the clitoris to the vaginal opening is variable. And the shorter the distance, we they tend to say less than one inch, the shorter the distance of the clitoris to the vaginal opening, the more likely you are to be able to orgasm um, during penetrative intercourse. And that's because the distance is so short that the angle of the man's body is sort of able to stimulate that area. If that distance is greater, you're less likely to be able to orgasm simply from penetrative intercourse. Cue introducing a vibrator, manual stimulation, et cetera. So what percentage of women are able to intercourse without any stimulatory vibrator or anything like that from intercourse? Less than 10%. Wow. So it's the same number that you have from the G-spot. Correct. So if a woman is listening to this and she's never had an orgasm through intercourse, she is in the 90%. There's nothing wrong with her. We would diagnose her as normal. And for those women out there who are regularly achieving an orgasm through intercourse, you're in the minority and... Or they're doing external, more, more likely, they're doing external stimulation of the clitoris. Those, those grave statistics are without any external manipulation of the clitoris. I see. So Got for it. women who are achieving orgasm with a partner, it's because they've identified positions with their partners. They're using manual stimulation. They're introducing vibrators. They've figured out, regardless of distance of clitoris to vaginal opening, how to stimulate the clitoris, the external part of the clitoris. And I like to talk about anatomy so that patients can sort of think about their own individual anatomy, talk to their partners about it, and think about if there's someone who needs to sort of introduce that external stimulation, or shall they, as a couple, just try to find the anterior branch of the clitoral nerve? There's lots you can, you can do as a part of that. How often do you have men in your practice who are there with their female partners who you're trying to educate? For a sexual health consult, 20% of the time. And what is the most common, um, I don't want to use the word ignorance, but what is the most common thing that you appreciate about men when you're helping them in terms of their lack of understanding about the, their partner's anatomy? Giving men a roadmap, being very descriptive. You know, men, most partners want their partners to be happy. It's not, you know, there's the selfish aspect of performance. And there's the sexual empathy component where they care about their partner and they want their partner to feel well. Giving them a roadmap to sort of explore around and find the anterior branch and think about the wishbone structures um, is really exciting to them. Um, desire, spontaneous desire, thinking through that is really exciting for them, how they tap into that, how they can curate that with your, their partner, thinking about their partner's arousal. Um, and then sort of supporting... There's a communication component. I think when we think about sexual dysfunction, we tend to break it down into a biopsychosocial model. Um, I like to talk mostly about bio. I'm a clinical physician. I'm a gynecologist, so I think a lot about anatomy and pathophysiology and neurotransmitters and hormones. But there's a lot of other people in this field that are helping with the psychosocial, sex therapists, communication. There's a great book called Sex Talks by Vanessa Marin, which talks about how to communicate with your partner. Um, Clitorate is a great book to think through different ways that you can sort of improve your communication about what pleasures you and how to investigate that. There's really good websites now. OMGyes.com is a website that sort of talks about your anatomy and how to find it and how to find your pleasure spots. So there's a lot out there. I'm not alone in this space by any means, but I like to think about it from a very sort of biologic, physiologic perspective. And so on the topic of sexual desire, what are the, you know, because this podcast is called The Drive and we're talking about cars, uh, what are the, what's the throttle and what's the brake pedal on sexual desire for men and for women? And I assume it's different. 